All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. And one of the nice things that I was able to swing with this course is I was able to figure out a way how to do labs online. That way, you don't have to risk coming to uh, ECC. A lot of the classes they have lab at the uh, main campus. Uh, I wish, I hope that works out well. But if you've been following the news, what's been happening at other college campuses, I wonder how long ECC can stay open with that. I hope for all the semester, but we'll see. You don't have to worry. All right, a couple things. First of all, again, my name is Dr. White and I'm an organic chemist. And throughout the semester, you'll learn a lot about me personally. It slips out during the semester always. And being an organic chemist, most of my adult life or good part of it, I worked in the chemical industry. And therefore, I know the real world. I know the real world of organic chemistry. When I was in the chemical industry, most of the time, I was a senior research and development manager, otherwise known as an R&D manager. And my job at the companies I worked at was to develop new products and to get them made in plants, chemical plants, and then also solve problems, both the, our company's problem and our customer's problem. So I've been out in the real world a lot. Also throughout the world, I worked for, let's see, uh, three international companies. So I spent a lot of time in Europe and Canada. I also consult and I spent, have spent time in Mexico. I think those days are over because of what's going on in the world, but thank goodness we have Zoom. All right. Sometimes I'm, when I'm looking at the camera, I don't see the chat. All right, uh, if you can't hear what's being said, for the person who can't hear it, check that your speakers are on. That's a mistake I've made early on Zoom. Oh, I can't hear anything. And it turns out, my speaker, you know, on your computer, you can shut off the speakers. I have, usually keep them shut off. Can everybody else hear me? Do a thumbs up if you can hear me. Thank you. Throughout, uh, I learned from the summer, like I said, the problems with Zoom and with Zoom, you have your little reaction button on your toolbar. You can click on that and do a thumbs up like I just did. And I'll go away in a couple of seconds. Go away. <laughs> it's supposed to go away. Or what I usually ask is if you give a thumbs up and that lets me know you when I ask a question. Oh, by the way, I'm glad you got it. And you never have to say sorry in my class. That's not a word that's necessary. All right, now everybody's fixed up. Let's get back. All right, couple things. Normally, if we were in a classroom at COD, I'd tell you, if you ask a question, be sure to, if you have, speak softly or speak with an accent or speak softly in an accent. I won't hear you because I have my hearing aids in. You notice no hearing aids because I have big amplified speakers, but still once in a while I may ask you to repeat something. Now, the most important thing I will be teaching you today is the following. In my class, in my life, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I'll ask, say that again. In my life, in my course, anywhere around me, 
there's no such thing as a dumb question, and there's no limit on questions. Now, sometimes in a lecture like this, if I can't help you immediately, I'm going to say, let's move on after lecture or in my office hour, come and see me. I'll try and explain it so you understand it. But again, feel free to ask questions. There's no such thing as a dumb question in my class. It took me till I think it was my third year in grad school. I was in our group meeting, my research group with my professor, and I was actually giving a talk. And we had a postdoctoral fellow, someone who already had a PhD in organic chemistry, was a member of our group working until he got a full-time job. I was a postdoctoral fellow at another school too. And he asked me a question about something very basic I was talking about that all undergrad chem majors should know. And he didn't. Well, I answered it. And afterward, and the person I'm talking about, and this I still remember his name, and I'll always be grateful to Dr. Larry Palavin. I said, Larry, weren't you embarrassed asking that question? That's something undergrads should know. I said, why should I be embarrassed? I didn't know it. Now I do. There's no, you should never be embarrassed asking a question. At that point, I realized and later on, I came up with the phrase I now use, there's no such thing as a dumb question. All right. Now, one of the things I usually do at the start of the semester right now, and if we're in the classroom, I would add, do it one way. Here, give me a thumbs up. And that is, how many of you are here because you have uh, are planning on a career in organic chemistry. Raise your hands, give me a thumbs up. Uh-oh, no one. How many of you are here for your, because you have an undying love of organic chemistry? Uh-oh, no one. How many of you are here because you gotta take organic chemistry to get into a program or a school? And the answer is everybody else. Well, I already knew that, but now you know that because I'm not going to try and convert you into being an organic chemist. But you'll find out my world of organic chemistry is really your world of organic chemistry. You don't know about it. Let's do a quick little thing. If you washed your hands, the soap, that's organic chemistry. And later in the semester, I'll teach you how did it get the dirt off your hands? That's organic chemistry. If you notice the color of my shirt, the dye is organic chemistry. Let's get personal. My skin, my hair, what's left of it, that's organic chemistry. All your food is organic chemistry, even though you hear the term organic food. And I always laugh when I see or hear that because all food is organic and that's organic chemistry. And later in the semester, I'll be teaching you way later, when you eat your food and swallow it and it goes in your stomach, the reactions in your stomach to break down your food is organic chemistry. So let's think. My skin is organic chemistry. My hair, what's left of it is organic chemistry. Everything is about around you is organic chemistry. So isn't it obvious why it's important to learn organic chemistry? Of course, because someone told you if you get a good grade, you can get into a program or school. I'm here to help you get the best grade you're willing to work for. And if you, how many of you read about me at ratemyprofessor.com? If you don't want to, You'll find out the semester if it's true or not. It is, but you'll find out. Luckily, this class, the end of last semester, I switched over to online. And this summer, I did a whole class at another school online. So I've got this pretty down pretty pat. All right, now, what I like to do first is go through the syllabus, but before I do, let me remind all of you that this is being recorded and within 24 hours or less, hopefully by this evening, if I don't have any things like someone gives me a winning lotto ticket, which I doubt will happen, uh, I will be posting 
this video, the video recording of our Zoom meetings on um, YouTube. I have my own Chem 170 YouTube channel. I have a couple others. Dr. White is a YouTube star. You know that. I am not really, but I do have a couple of YouTube channels. And you'll be able to watch this or go back and look at things. Or if you miss our um, lectures or lab meetings, you can go there. Even though in the catalog it says this is a virtual classroom meeting, I'm actually making this class asynchronous. I'm not going to take attendance. So if you miss coming to class, you can always pick it up in uh, YouTube. I want to say Zoom, that's not right. All right, thumbs I'm going to call you. I came up with this term this uh, summer. Thumbs up, people. Do you see the syllabus? Thank you. All right. We'll be meeting 1 to 350. Important thing I want to mention is uh, if we're in a classroom after about 50 minutes sitting in a classroom, students' brains shut down. Same thing happens here. We're going to be taking breaks. Also, me sitting in a chair for more than an hour, I need to get and stretch my legs. Otherwise, they'll cramp up. So we'll be taking breaks. Because of that, in the classroom, normally I take a 10-minute break. But for this, I'm going to take five-minute breaks. So I'm going to let you out 15 minutes earlier than this time on Monday. Now, on Wednesday, the catalog, because they asked me how long would you be in class if you were in, technically it would be this. But in real life at ECC, once in a while, I'll say the wrong school, COD, just like the computer system at ECC is D2L, at COD is Blackboard. I sometimes get those switched. But here I'll lecture from 1 to 1.50, take a five minute break. Then we'll do about 20 minutes or more while I'll explain the lab. Because one, organic, I'm not going to have you buy kits and do stuff in your home because you really can't organic, it's too dangerous. And therefore, we're not going to be spending the actual time in the lab, so on Wednesdays you'll get out a lot earlier. I have links to the Zoom lecture. Here's the Zoom office hours. One of the nice things now that ECC gave all faculty Zoom accounts is normally, if we we're at ECC, right after the lectures, I have my office hour. And that's the only time I'm on campus. But now I've switched it tonight, where it might be better for a lot of you. And if you really need to see me, email me and we'll set up a special meeting. I'm here to help you. Now, here's a phone number. And I can't remember what year I last, it's really a voicemail box. I last checked it. I don't think in the last five years I've checked it. I don't even remember what the password is. Don't call. The best way to reach me is by email. I check that religiously minimum twice a day. Now, the twice a day, uh, all my life, I have been an early riser. I usually go to bed about 11.15, and I'm usually up by 5 o'clock. So by 6 a.m., I've checked my email, and usually later in the afternoon and evening, I'll check it again. That's the best way to reach me. Course requirements, I'm required to pop in there. Same thing, the objectives. Now, behavior policy. Uh, since we're in a Zoom meeting, I can shut off your microphones. I can also kick people out, but that didn't happen last semester. Uh, but please be tolerant, read this. Your behavior is um, unacceptable. I'll let you know. I'd Correct it. If you don't, I'll give you an F and keep you out of the class. It won't drop you though if it's really bad, which I, it's only happened once at the other school many years ago. A student had probably, and I'm a chemist, not a psychologist or psychiatrist, serious mental problems that I got rid of them real quick because they were just totally disrupting the class. 
Remember to follow student's code of conduct and you shouldn't cheat. Now, here I forgot to take this out. I should have. Uh, if you want to eat here in your home, feel free to, or wherever you are. Uh, same thing, I forgot to take this out because all exams will be online. All right, do not raise your hand, do not turn on your mic, but if you're a special needs student, let me know in private, email me or come to my office hour. I have always, always met and helped the needs of any special needs students. And I've had a number of them over the years. I've been teaching at ECC for a long time now. And I will help you any way I can. I just want to make sure you understand that. All right, now, this semester we'll be going through organic chemistry. And there'll be four tests. These are tentative dates. Once in a while, if I see the class needs extra time, I will change the dates, but essentially they will. Now, what I'll be doing is sending out a PDF file or putting it in the assignment area of D2L, and you'll download it. Then the day of the test, I'll send out an email with the password to open that PDF file. Now, if you do not have a printer, relax. What you'll do is on your screen or however you're viewing my class or that PDF file, you can write down the answers on a piece of paper. I think everybody here has a cell phone. If you have a scanner, you can scan it, upload it as a PDF file. If you have a cell phone, I have a file leading you to an app, uh, how to make PDF files with your cell phone. There are actually two different ways, and that way you can upload it. It worked perfectly this summer. Last spring, we had a little trouble because I didn't know the certain app was available, which I learned about after the fall. Uh, the spring semester. So that's how we'll do tests. There'll be a final exam. I'll be giving it Monday at 1 p.m. But for those of you, since this, I'm going to make this asynchronous, I haven't figured out exactly. But I'll work it out so you'll all have time. Now, one of the things I do want to mention that I haven't totally figured out this summer, I don't think I had a problem, but who knows? But I know other faculty at both schools had a problem with giving tests online or like this uh, for classes like this with a tremendous amount of cheating going on. Not that I'm in any way implying any of you would cheat, but there was. Uh, one faculty member caught a student cheating by being online with a tutor during the test. Nope, you can't do that. What I will do is for each test, somehow, either through your cell phone or webcam right now, I'll ask you to turn it on and show me your picture ID and your face. Uh, one of the ways people were cheating this summer, they were hiring people to take their tests. You know, what can I say? And I'm not going to go into the other methods. But I'm going to try and minimize it. But at the same time, I'm going to try and trust you. But there's still some things I have to do. If there's any problem, uh, I'm going to ask again. And you're going to get tired of me saying this. Can everybody see the makeup policy? Thumbs up, people. Can you see it? Good, thank you. I just need one person to let me know. If there's a reason for a makeup policy, a makeup exam or whatever, let me know. Uh, I'm pretty laid back. I'm here to help you get a good grade and learn organic chemistry. All right, now, one of the things you're probably interested in, how do you get a good grade in this class? Well, it's based on points. You're going to have four tests. 
And what I will be doing is dropping the lowest score of those four tests. And the sum of those three highest tests max will be 300 points. The final exam will be 200 points relaxed. I've used this formula many years and students have successfully, or I should say gotten great grades in my class. I'm gonna do something new this uh, fall. I have practice problems and I'm gonna ask you to do some of them, hand them in. Each one is worth one point. This is to make sure since you're at home that you're working on the practice problems because that will help you learn organic chemistry, but more important, get a good grade. We'll have lab reports and those will be worth uh, 10 points each. There'll be 13 labs. I dropped the lowest lab in case you do bad in a lab. And that adds up to 630 points. How do you get a grade? Well, first of all, you have to calculate your percentage. The percentage is the sum of the three highest tests, the final exam points, your lab totals, practice problems. And usually I give one extra credit project, add those up, multiply by 100, divide by 630, you'll get a percentage. If your percentage is 90 and above, you get an A, B, 80, 89, C, 70, 79, D, 60, 69, below that F. Uh, I will not give uh, final grades by phone or email. Well, actually I will in this class uh, or any test grades. What I had to do is how do I, in a classroom, I grade the test, give them back to you, and you can see what you did wrong. Well, luckily, you've got a power user and computers and software. And this summer, actually last uh, spring, but this summer I perfected it. I will send each of you an individual email, which each points for each part or question on a test. So that way you'll know how you've done. Also, every test I give, the next lecture, at the beginning of the lecture, I go through the whole test so you can see the actual answers. Uh, unfortunately, that thing I always cut out of the video, but if you're not here for that, come to my office hours and I'll always go through that. Withdrawal policy, follow what's in the student. Uh, you've got to consult with the registration center. Uh, not attending classes or taking tests doesn't officially withdraw you. I do issue a grade. Do you need an incomplete? Uh, I do do those under any kind of emergency. One thing about withdrawal, because of COVID-19, I think this has been really relaxed. You have a much later date when you can do that. All right, here's my tentative schedule. And I usually follow this. What we'll be doing for each of the weeks, I also have the test dates. I always give a test on a Wednesday because that gives me more time to uh, grade it. In Chem 170, I never ever use multiple choice tests. So that means it takes me a couple of hours to grade your test, which I think you people are worth it, which is why. Because frankly, I hate multiple choice tests. They're designed to trick students, not give you the opportunity to show me what you know. So that's why I give them on Wednesday, usually at the latest by Sunday, 1 p.m. I'm grading usually at some time finish grading, usually it's sometimes Saturday or even earlier, depending on my schedule. And uh, this semester, because of the way the school wanted us to set up Blackboard and the course, we had to put in certain modules on, on D2L, and those are to help you keep track, but essentially it's this right here. I'll be following. Now the lab, good news, you don't have to buy a lab manual because I wrote the labs. If we were at ECC main campus, 
same thing. I wrote all the labs because one of the problems with 170, the lab is only at this school an hour and 50 minutes. If we were at the actual campus, other schools, it's usually two hours and 50 minutes, which means I can't use any of the lab manuals that you could buy. And I had to, when I took over 170 years ago, and I challenged myself because the labs I was given were, how should I say this politely, awful, actually beyond awful. So I've written my own labs. You'll have 13 labs, each one's 10 points. And here's the schedule. This week we won't. I don't know about the safety video. I've got to check into that. And here are the different experiments. What I will be doing is in the assignment area, I will attach the PDF file, and it's also, I'll have it as a Word file for the lab. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do these in your home. So what I've done is put in the data, you'll have to interpret the data and answer questions. And if we were at campus, you have to do the data, get the data yourself, but we're not. I don't think anybody, including Dr. White, has a melting point apparatus at home. The only one you might be able to do at home are the spices. It's a fun lab, too. Now, one of the things I do in this class is a student agreement. And let's do something I haven't done. Give me a second why log into D2L. For some reason, it's not letting me log in. That's weird. Let me try one more time. Now that I have what I need on a Well, that's Murphy's Law hits me again. Hold on a second. One of the smart things I did years ago. All right, this is called the signature sheet. Can everybody see where it says I print your name? Good. All right. This is a signature sheet. I have both a Word document and a PDF. And this is a document which I'm going to ask you before the first test. Print your name. And if you can sign it, if not, print your name and put your date and email. It to, or I'll actually have it as assignment uh, in uh, D2L and upload it. This is something I need before the first test. If you haven't signed it, I won't let you take the first test. And all it says essentially, you've read the uh, syllabus, understand the policies of the class, and understand that it's your responsibility to abide by that. And failure to abide by the policies will result in the consequences outlined in the syllabus. And uh, you should read the syllabus. The main things is uh, what are your responsibilities in terms of class participation or how you act in a class and also about cheating. All right, that's done. Uh, it's important, but it's not the most exciting thing. Now, let me ask a quick question of all of you. I'm gonna go full screen on your videos. 
How many of you heard of nasty things about organic chemistry? Raise your hand. I see a couple. It's not true. It's not true. But then I'm biased. I'm an organic chemist. Now, one of the things probably why you've heard bad things about organic chemistry was whoever taught it didn't teach it well. In fact, a lot of the schools, they teach it in a way which is just wrong. And it makes it quite impossible. Now, where did I see that? Uh, at University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana about four or five years ago, I found out the counselors there were telling students who needed organic chemistry when they came back to either DuPage County or Kane County, which I teach at both schools, to take it with me. And I was sort of, sort of floored the fact that the counselors were telling me, telling their students, take me, don't take it at U of I Champaign. Why? Because I found out why uh, some of the students shared what they were taking it a second time, how they did it. And it just was making it impossible to learn. Organic chemistry is fun. This is the way I teach it. So relax, take a deep breath. Now, not today, maybe Wednesday. If you suffer from test anxiety, let me go full screen for me. I had came up a number of years ago with a method that eliminates test anxiety. Meaning if you get real nervous and you have problems taking a test, I will teach it to you. This, let's do it this Wednesday, right after our lecture and it's free, stick around. If you can't make it on Wednesday, come to my office hour, I'll teach you then. It takes about 10 minutes and it's quite effective. Over the years, I've seen students go from getting Ds and Fs on tests to getting high As, not only in my class, but in all their classes. So I'll do that. All right, let me ask any questions. All right, going once, going twice. All right, it's now time to start your journey into my world of organic chemistry, which is really your world of organic chemistry. If I can log into D2L, which I don't need to luckily. Let me just get rid of a few things I don't need open. All right, first of all, you do not have to buy the book for my class. For a number of years now, students haven't bought the book, if you go to ratemyprofessor.com, you'll see they'll tell you, don't buy the book. Why? Because my lectures do the job. All my slides you'll see on the screen here are in uh, D2L. Also, I provide practice problems during the semester and the answers to the practice problems. With that, students have done quite well. In fact, a number of years ago, when I found out about students weren't reading the book, about half, two thirds through the semester, I asked students, how many of you are reading the book? Raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand. At first I was sort of upset until I realized, look at the test scores up to now. They're quite good. And I don't get any kickbacks from the book uh, publisher. So don't buy the book, unless you really have to. Then if you want, get an old copy or get a digital. I do follow the contents of in the book, but other books are the same way for organic chemistry. Now, if you look at the book, there's a first chapter that goes into a little about organic chemistry, then has what's called all these functional groups. And some instructors make you memorize them right then. It's a waste of time. 
you'll learn them during the semester and that makes your ability to learn it much easier. Now, important warning, you will not learn organic chemistry the night before a test or two nights. You got to keep up. Now, how do you succeed in organic chemistry to get a good grade? Because I assume you all want to get a good grade. And generally in my class, I expect 70% of the students to get an A or, and usually I can see that. Sometimes it's more. Oh, by the way, I should tell you something personal about me. I'm a very selfish person. I'm selfish in the way that I like things to happen around me that make me happy. And one of the things that makes me very happy is seeing students succeed. So I will do and provide whatever help it, you need for you to get the best grade you're willing to work for. Now, how do you succeed in organic chemistry? In order to learn that, I'm gonna to have to talk about bicycles. Bicycles? Yeah, bicycles. Let's assume I'm the nicest guy around, and I am, but, and I give you, you don't know how to ride a bicycle, and I give you the best Blu-ray ever made how to ride a bicycle. And now you have a large screen TV, a Blu-ray player, and you watch that Blu-ray. And you watch it, you watch it day after day, you slow it down, watch it frame by frame, slow motion, and you watch it to the point where you know every frame on there by heart in your memory. What's gonna happen the first day you get on a bike, first time? I'll get, uh, whoever asked the question, I'll come back to those slides. But anyways, and your question, let me finish what I'm doing first. You get on the bike the first day and you've never ridden a bike, what's gonna happen? You fall off and you get back on the bike and you still fall off. And then after time, you hopefully you get good and you ride the bike. Organic chemistry is no different. Do the practice problems, that's why I created them. The ones in most books are awful, so I created my own long ago. Those are your practice problems. After test one, you'll understand why I call them practice problems. One of the things I like to look at myself in the monitor instead of look at the my webcam. So if I'm looking down, that's what I'm doing. Bad Dr. White. But anyways, practice. Most of you probably aren't old enough to remember, but I think you've heard the name Michael Jordan. When Michael Jordan was with the Bulls, at a certain stretch of time, he was the best of the best of the best player, the very best player in the NBA. And always, every once in a while on TV or in the newspaper, you'd hear a story or see a story, Michael Jordan, best player, but he's the first person on the practice court, always the last one off. How did he become the best of the best of the best? Practice. And he stayed that way by practice. Also, a lot of guys given talents and abilities. So is in order to learn organic chemistry, keep up and practice. Let's see. Uh, all the PowerPoints are in uh, Blackboard in the lecture folder. Unfortunately, when we take our break, I'm gonna try and log into Blackboard. I don't know why it doesn't like me today, because earlier today I logged in the same way. But, all the lecture uh, slides, which are available both as a Word document and a PDF, in case you don't have MS Office on your, or Word on your computer or whatever device you're looking at. And I've done that. All right, let's get started. And I'll ask my thumbs up people. Everybody see chapter two? Thank you. All right. When we start out, the first place to start out is the hydrocarbons. What is a hydrocarbon? 
their molecules with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. You should know what is a hydrocarbon. And again, these slides you're seeing now are on D2L. If you want to take notes, feel free to. And if you're in lecture, you would. And also, I'll be posting this video. Now, one of the things I'm going to be doing throughout the semester is how many of you can read my mind? Let's find out. I'm going to think of something. All right. How many of you could read my mind and think I was thinking about bicyclo 222 octanones? Nobody. By the way, that's molecules I use for my research for my PhD thesis when I got my PhD from Michigan State. So at times I'm going to tell you, you should know this. Hint, I'd be very subtle about that. Now in this class, there's going to be a lot of memorization and I not going to sugarcoat it. When we get to the reactions, I'll teach you a way how to memorize things. All right, you should all see hydrocarbons right now. You should know if I ask on a test, what is a hydrocarbon? And you should know it's a molecule with only carbon and hydrogen atoms. And a lot of the stuff you probably heard in the news the last couple of years about hydrocarbon emissions from cars causing pollution and global warming. Yes, I believe in global warming. Now, when we talk about hydrocarbons, there are two types of hydrocarbons you should know. The first is a saturated hydrocarbon. And a saturated hydrocarbon are molecules with only carbon hydrogen atoms. That's what a hydrocarbon is. But saturated tells you in which all carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. I'll teach you later in the chapter what's a single bond and other bonds. Oh, one of the things when I teach, and I actually I didn't come up with this phrase, one of my former students said it, is, I never assume students will fill in any blanks because there are no blanks when I teach. All right, so you should know what is a saturated hydrocarbon. And that's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms, which all carbon carbon bonds are single bonds. What's an example of a saturated hydrocarbon? Gasoline is mainly saturated hydrocarbons. All right. Propane, which is the stuff you use for your barbecue, that's a saturated hydrocarbon. Now, sometimes on a test, I'll ask, give an example of a saturated hydrocarbon. And you could put down propane or gasoline. Now, another type of hydrocarbon you should know is unsaturated hydrocarbons. What is an unsaturated hydrocarbon? That's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms that contains one or more carbon-carbon multiple bonds. And you'll learn next chapter, we call those double or triple bonds. So an unsaturated hydrocarbon are molecules with only carbon hydrogen atoms that contain one or more carbon atoms, a multiple carbon bonds. And that would be a double or triple bond. Now I wrote right on the screen, but example of that, and I'll teach you later when we get into chapter three, is an unsaturated hydrocarbon is responsible for the color of carrots. And that's called beta carotene. In fact, I'm not going to cheat you.
beta carotene. Carrots are orange because of an unsaturated hydrocarbon. Bet you never thought I'd get into carrots or stuff in this class. Just wait. You'll be amazed all the stuff I can get into that's organic chemistry and have a good time doing it. And hopefully you are too. So hopefully you can all see the slides now. If not, yell out. All right, let's go through this again. What's a hydrocarbon? A molecule with only carbon hydrogen atom. We have two types of hydrocarbons. One is a saturated hydrocarbon. And that's a molecule with only carbon hydrogen atoms in which all carbon carbon bonds are single bonds. So if a molecule has only carbon carbon single bonds, only carbon hydrogen atoms, it's a saturated hydrocarbon. And the one you're most familiar with is propane. That's the stuff in the white bottles for your barbecue. And gasoline. I should really be honest, about half the weight of gasoline are saturated hydrocarbons. And I'll teach you today or on Wednesday when you're familiar with the name. Now, an unsaturated hydrocarbon are molecules with only carbon hydrogen atoms that contain one or more carbon-carbon multiple bonds, which we call a double bond or triple bond. An example of that would be the chemical in carrots that caused them to be orange, beta carotene. Another one I'll teach you next chapter is if you look at tomatoes when they're ripe, red, that's also a different unsaturated hydrocarbon that's called a uh, lycopene, which I won't ask you. I'll go over it again when we go into that. Now, when we talk about saturated hydrocarbons, there's a very special one called the alkanes. And alkanes are known as acyclic saturated hydrocarbons. Now, hydrocarbon, you already know, that's a molecule that has only carbon hydrogen atoms. Saturated means it has only carbon carbon single bonds. What's this acyclic? Now, letter A means without, and cycle, you know, means a circle. Well, in organic chemistry, molecules that are in a circle, which we call a ring, are cyclic. Molecules that are always straight, in a straight line, we call acyclic. So an alkane, and I won't ask on a test, what's the definition of an alkane? I think you already have enough, but an alkane is an acyclic saturated hydrocarbon. Now, switch, oh. I need to teach you something I'll be doing throughout this whole semester. Since I proved earlier today, you can't read my brain, Every once in a while, I'll say, click the switch. Will this be on a test is in the off position. That means I'm going to talk about something that you should be familiar with, but I will never, ever ask a question on that on the test. Now, if I look at my clock, I see it's about time for a break. So everybody, let's take a break. Come back at 1.55. And I'll see them because Dr. White's going to do a stretching exercise so I don't, my legs don't cramp up. I'll see you back in five minutes.
All right, let's get back to work. I'll ring the bell, ding, ding, everybody come back. For those of you who've ever seen the old cartoons or TV shows or the school marm ring the bell to get her students back in class. Well, I just did that. All right. We're talking about alkanes. And alkanes are acyclic, which means straight chain, not in a ring. I'll teach you what I mean by that. Saturated hydrocarbons. Switches off for the slide. Now, the formula for alkanes are Cn H2n plus 2. Now, I will never ask on a test, but I've been told some entry exam test, the organic part, I'll ask you, do you have an alkane with four carbons? How many hydrogens? You have to know this formula. I will never, ever ask that on a test. Now, alkanes have what's known as the tetrahedral geometry around each carbon. If this were a carbon here, the bond angles, this won't be on a test day ever, is 104 degrees, 104 point something. And this is called tetrahedral. If this were a carbon here, these could be hydrogens, this would be methane, your natural gas. Again, this won't be on the test. So an alkane is an acyclic saturated hydrocarbon. Let's look at some alkanes. And this dawned on me something I do in class. I haven't done, so I better start doing it now. All right, what I'm going to do, you don't have to write down. This is propane. Propane has three carbons. This is a alkane, three carbons, CH3, CH2, CH3. Uh, I'm going to be doing an experiment. And over the next hour or 50 minutes, I'm going to be trying to set the Guinness Book of World Record for showing you propane the most times. And I'll explain why after I'm done doing my experiment. Anyways, for this slide switches off, what are some alkanes in your daily life? Methane, CH4. Actually, I'll mention this and this you should know. And where do you find methane? Natural gas. If you cook with a stove that has a gas flame or oven. Most of you, I think, have, <clears throat> excuse me, furnaces that are, once the winter hits, uses a flame to heat up your apartment, condo, or home. And that's what is being burned is methane, CH4. And if you have a water heater, most of you have a gas water heater for your apartment, condo or home, it's burning methane, natural gas. Now, another alkane is ethane. And where do I see this mostly? One, the most common place is, if you ever watch some sort of comp athletic competition, basketball game, soccer game, or anything, and you see the player sprain their ankle, and they're walking around. <laughs> if I were in class, I'd be pointing my ankle now. And the trainer comes out and has a silver tube and sprays something on the ankle, or it could be other parts of their body, but it's usually ankle. And all of a sudden, you see that player walking around. That contains liquid ethane. When it hits the skin, it evaporates and it makes it real cold. The same is, but even better than putting an ice pack on. That's the main use of ethane. 
I think certain vegetables to ripen give off ethane if you trap it, like making an avocado ripen, you put it in a bag, that's what's helping it ripen. And finally, propane, which is CH3, CH2, CH3. Where are you going to find that? That's the material, the liquid, which becomes a gas for your barbecue. And that's what you do that. All right, before I do this, I made a promise, so I better keep it. Propane, CH3, CH2. CH3, propane, the stuff for your barbecue. If you ever work at a construction site, propane is also used for heating up the area, just like a furnace in your house. All right, now we have alkanes and we also have cycloalkanes. And the term prefect cyclo means circle, a circle. And cycloalkanes are saturated hydrocarbons, which the carbon atoms are connected to one another in a cyclic, which organic chemists call a ring arrangement. I'll never ask you what is a cycloalkane, but I'll use that term. And cycloalkanes rings have the general formula CnH2n, which I'll never ask on a test, but like I said, certain entrance exams, the organic part ask, if you have five carbons in a ring, how many hydrogens? The answer would be 10, but I'll never, that's a stupid question to ask on a test. Now, not all rings are planar, and that's cycloalkanes. And I should warn you, Dr. White loves rings. Oh, I love them so much. And at this point, I'll mention a lot during the semester, who is the greatest of all organic chemists? Anybody know? It's Mother Nature. Mother Nature by far is the greatest of all organic chemists. Just look at us, look outside your window later today. You'll see the trees, the grass, the food you eat. All that is organic chemistry at the highest level. And by the way, Mother Nature loves rings too. Now, not all rings are planar, meaning flat like a piece of paper. I'll teach you more about that later in the semester. So we have alkanes and cycloalkanes. And by the way, propane is still CH3, CH2, CH3. I should mention at this point, a very valid question you can always ask and the answer will be yes is could you go back to that last slide and explain something again or just let me see it again and i'll always say yes and i will do it because remember in my class there's no such thing as a dumb question Now, one of the most important things you'll be doing this semester on the test, and it's an important part of organic chemistry, is drawing molecules and organic molecules. And we have different ways of doing that. One is called condensed structures, which I'll show you. Another one is condensed structures with parentheses. Now, one of the most important things besides there's no such thing as a dumb question that I'm going to teach you right now today and will be important for you to know on every test is how many bonds are there to carbon? There are always four bonds to carbon. 
this must look like it's coming right at you. It is. If I were in class, I'd do this. Let's see, I'm in 3D, but we're not in class, so I'm just in 2D. Uh, but you should remember there are four bonds to carbon. If you remember that and check when you're drawing things, answers on a test, I would say on every test in the final, 60% or more of the people who got things wrong would have noticed that can't be right. If you have three bonds to carbon in answer, that's going to be wrong. If you have four, it's correct. Five is wrong. One time I had a student put a structure down, had seven bonds to carbon, and I just started laughing for the red pen said, mm, wrong. I won't be able to use a red pen here, but you understand the point. Now, first of all, propane is CH3, CH2, CH3. Let's look at how you draw a molecule. Let's say you have, and I'll teach you this later on, butane. Butane has four carbons. And it's an alkane, so it's not in a ring. Let's put our four carbons here. Now, you don't have to put the line there, but Dr. White does, because if I don't, my structures start falling down to the ground, both on a whiteboard and with my tablet. Now, notice here, well, I'm not gonna use that one again. This carbon is bonded to this carbon. That's what that line indicates of carbon, carbon, single bond. So this carbon here, has one bond there, but there's always four bonds to carbon. So how would we know how many hydrogens are here? Well, four minus one equals three. So therefore this carbon, and we show it this way, has three hydrogens. So it has the bond to carbon and three hydrogens, four bonds. Let's look at, take a look at this one. How many bonds? One, two. It should have four. And now we'll do four minus two equals two. So this should have, I'll write it over here better, two hydrogens. Notice this carbon right here has one, two bonds. It should always have four bonds. Four minus two, two, as has two hydrogens. And finally, this last carbon here, how many bonds does it have? initially one bond, but it should have four, four minus one equals three. So I'm gonna put three hydrogens. And that's how you know and how you draw molecules. Every carbon should have four bonds. If it doesn't, it's made up by hydrogens. And it just dawned on me, I forgot to mention something very important about my class. My class, the math requirement is very hard. For my class, you need to know the numbers zero through 10. You have to know from one through 10, which numbers are greater and smaller than the others, like five is greater than three. That you have to know, see it's real hard. And the other real hard part is you have to know how to add and subtract up to four because there are four bonds to carbon. And guess what? That's the only math you'll be doing. And I'm so strict on my test, you won't be able to use a calculator. You can't. Because the only math you have to know is how to add and subtract up to four and how to count up to 10 
you can use your fingers if you want to count, and have to know from numbers one through 10, which are larger than, which are smaller, like nine is larger than seven. And that's the whole math. So you can all now crack a smile. No, you don't have to. Back again, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane, the material in used to, for your barbecue to make the flame. Now, one of the things I like to do is I'm having a lot of fun and that's not right. I should share the fun. So I share the fun during this, my lectures why well, let you try and work on it. Now, when we do it in a class, what I'll do is I would have said, all right, now you try this, then I'll give you some time. And if I were in the class, I'd say, when you're done, look up and smile. By the way, Dr. White gets goofy in front of a web camera, but in a classroom too sometimes. But we can't, well, I could do that. If you don't have your video on, I'll say, when you're done, give me a thumbs up. So let's share. Now, remember, there's always four, oops, four bonds to carbon, four bonds to carbon. That's your friend. And I forgot to mention butane is the liquid found in those inexpensive of lighters. Now, for this, why don't you try putting in the hydrogens? Remember, there are four bonds to carbon. Ready, set, go. Right, if you're done, give me a thumbs up. Either we'll push him up. It looks like just about everybody's done. Also, if you're done, you can also, if you don't have a video link, you can use the little thing at the bottom of your screen for Zoom. All right, let's go ahead and do this. All right, first carbon, how many bonds to that? One, there's always four bonds to carbon, always. If you find an exception to this rule, let me know. We'll be rich beyond my wildest dreams and my wildest dreams goes beyond my own fighter jets, Lamborghini and Island in the South Pacific. Beyond that, it doesn't happen. So this carbon has one bond. There should be four. Therefore, four minus one is three, CH3. This carbon, how many bonds? One, two. It always should have four bonds. Four minus two, two. And we show that that way. This carbon, how many bonds that? One, two. And now, Four minus should always be four bonds to carbon, four minus two, two hydrogens. This carbon, same thing, two bonds. Always oh, should have four, four minus two, two hydrogens. Now, the last one, one bond. You should always have four bonds. Four minus one is three. And that's how you do it. Let me write it over again. So in case it doesn't look clear to you. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's try something else. 
first, Dr. White will do one, then I'll let you have fun too. All right, let's look at this molecule. This carbon has one bond, should always have four bonds to carbon. Therefore, four minus one is three. Let's go over here, same thing, one bond to carbon. Four minus one, because carbon always has four bonds, is three. We come up down here. This carbon has one bond to it. Carbon should always have four bonds to it. Four minus one, three. Now let's look at this carbon because you've already done that. It has, I'm gonna go technicolor on you. It has this bond and this bond. So it's got two bonds. It should always have four bonds. Therefore four minus two is two. Now let's take a look at this carbon. And before I do it, I'm going to ask you, and I do rhetorical questions, how many bonds do you see to that carbon? I'll tell you in a second, but why don't you think about it? All right, time's up. Put down your pens and pens. No, I'm just kidding. Let's look at this one. This carbon here has one bond, two bonds, three bonds. How many bonds should there always be? Four bonds to carbon. Therefore, four minus three equals one. And I'll put a hydrogen there. And if I redraw this, and that's how you do that. Now, before I move on, propane, it's still CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. And now it's your turn. Why don't you fill in the hydrogens? Remember, There's always four bonds to carbon. Off on. When you're done, give me a thumbs up, either with uh, your video feed or your, I see everybody found their thumbs up button too. All right, let's get going. How many bonds to carbon? One here, four, there's always four bonds to carbon. Four minus one, three. This is the mass as a three. Let's look at this carbon, one bond to carbon, four minus one, three, three hydrogens. Let's look at this one, same thing. One bond, four minus one, because there's always four bonds to carbon, three. Ooh, another one, same thing, one bond, four minus one, 
is three. Oh, another one. Four minus one. If I can draw it. Is three. Now, let's look at this carbon right here. How many bonds to it? One, two. Four bonds to carbon. Four minus two is two. So this has CH3. Now the last carbon we have to do is this one. How many bonds to that? One, two, three, four. Well, there's always four bonds to carbon. Four minus four is zero. So I'm done. Or did I do this one? Yeah, I forgot to put the hydrogen in there. I will do that once in a while. That had one. It has one, two, three bonds. Four minus three is one. So if I rewrite this, And here's how you do that. <clears throat> and guess what time it is? It's time to say propane, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. And propane is the stuff you use for your barbecue. See how hard organic chemistry is? Uh, it's really, no, it's not, it's fun. But I'm biased, I'm an organic chemist. Now, here I have where I talk about parentheses. Quick check. Everybody see the blank screen? Thumbs up, you see it, I uh, thank you. All right, now, let's look at a molecule like this. Now, organic chemists, you'll find out this semester, we're lazy. Whenever there's a shortcut for less work for us, we'll do that. If you notice in this molecule, I have a repeating group, the CH2 group. Now, how many times is it repeating? One, two, three, four. So a shortcut, which I would recommend you not do now. I'll use it when we get near the end of the semester when we talk about fats and oils, I use it. But until then, that's about week 13 or 14, I might be off by a week. But this is called using parentheses. Have a parenthesis. What's the repeating unit? CH2. Close the parentheses. Then subscript. You put the number four, because that's how many times it was repeating. And you do that. And for large molecules, which this is really not, this is the way to go. On my test, I will not do that. The students have a harder time with this than this. Therefore, until we get the fats and oils, we're talking about big molecules with 18 carbons, I will not use parentheses. If you want to, feel free to. Another thing which I didn't mention, oh, I get to say it again. This is one way of drawing propane. Propane again is CH3, CH2, CH3. It's called the condensed form because you'll rarely ever see me do this and I'd recommend you don't. 
This is the expanded form, which we rarely do in organic chemistry, but it's a lot of extra work and we're lazy. I'd recommend you not do it on a test because it's a lot of extra work for you too. But if you do, I know what it is because I have a piece of paper signed by the Board of Regents from Michigan State University, my PhD diploma saying I understand this stuff. Oh, by the way, I can get to say it again, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. And I've just done some examples. You had some fun with it too. Now, before I talk more about how to draw cyclic organic compounds, time out for a commercial from Dr. White. And don't forget, in my class, in my world, there's no such thing as a dumb question. If you ever have any questions, either put it in the comments. Sometimes the comments when I'm in share don't pop up or just unmute your microphone and ask away. I should ask any questions so far. Now, when we talk about cyclic compounds, in the first class you'll learn about, probably today or Wednesday, cycloalkanes, they're represented by polygons. Oh, one good thing about my class, you'll learn a lot of neat new words that you can impress your friends, neighbors, and loved ones with if you're on the phone with them or you're doing social distancing, which I hope you are. Poly, many, gone, cited. And the rules, which I'll never ask you what the rule is, Every bend in a line is a carbon atom. And I won't use this each end of the line. Actually, this is another way of drawing uh, alkanes, which I won't, the line method. And each intersection of a line is a carbon atom. Hydrogen atoms are not shown. Now, let me show you how you do this. And hopefully you all see the whiteboard. All right, let's look at the following molecule and put down your diary. This is one of the rare times I'll draw out a ring, a cycloalkane with actual carbons. And remember there are two bonds to carbon. So each carbon already has two bonds. So each one has a two hydrogens. Now this is, you'll never see me doing that again on a rare occasion. How do you draw it and how should you? How many carbons are there or how many? There are six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So for each carbon in your ring, and this is called a ring. You have a side. And for this molecule, this is how you would draw it. Now, how many of you have ever heard the term, I'm having a bad hair day? I think a lot of you have. Sometimes Dr. White has bad ring drawing days, and other times they're pretty good. I've been doing this a few more months than you, so it's going to look better. Let's do one more. This is a five member ring. I'll put in the hydrogen. You can tell it doesn't look too pretty because I rarely draw this like this. How would you draw that properly? How many carbons in that molecule? One, two, three, that's a C, F, four, five. And how you should draw that. A 
Let me try it again. And this is how you would draw this. And notice each bend of the line, one, two, three, four, five. You'll learn later this was called cyclopentane. And whenever I see this, I think of the little greenhouses in Monopoly. I don't know how many of you played Monopoly, but I did. By the way, when I was a little kid, when I played with my sisters, if you went to the bathroom, the other person would steal all the money from the bank. We played cutthroat Monopoly when we were about seven or eight. If one got sick, we usually all were home from school. Soon we used to play Monopoly a lot and cheat a lot. Don't tell my sisters I said that. All right, let me give you something to practice. And but first, a commercial from Dr. White. And notice propane, three carbons, and CH3, CH2, CH3, propane. Now, what I like you to try and I'll let you do this on your own. Now you call that a square, organic chemists call that a ring. And I would ask you to take a look at that and tell me, and not tell me, but think about how many carbons in that ring. I'll give you 3.8 seconds more. One, two, three, 3.2, 3.7, done. If we look at here, how many bends in a line? One, two, three, four. So there are four carbons. And a lot of times you'll see me abbreviate carbons by the C instead of writing it out like this. I can spell it. By the way, Dr. White was always the first one down in spelling bee. Science, math, I always want. But anyways, this is a four-membered ring. By the way, you can find in penicillin a four-membered ring. So the things I'm teaching you are in your daily life. Hopefully you're not using penicillin, but if you ever needed it, there's a four-membered ring in penicillin. And that's how you draw cycloalkanes. Which is off, but a term I might use during the semester are isomers. This will never be on a test. What's an isomer? An isomer is a compound with the same molecular formula, but different structural formulas. What would be an example of an isomer? And this will never be on a test. Since you haven't learned how to name molecules yet, I'll call it A and B. If you look at A, it has four carbons and 10 hydrogens. If you look at B, it has four carbons and 10 hydrogens. These are called isomers. They have different physical properties, and not with this case, but in certain cases, isomers have different properties like how they interact in your body. And these are called isomers. And oh, there are a lot of isomers in nature. Now, that reminds me, quick Dr. White story. A couple of years ago, I was in my family room with my big TV, watching cable TV. I forgot what program. I'm in my laser boy. Dr. White's had laser boys for many decades now. I shouldn't have said that. But anyways, I'm watching the TV. And I see on the TV a commercial for this perfume company. Okay, by the way, perfume is very sophisticated organic chemistry. You'll learn that later in the semester. 
see organic chemistry is everywhere. By the way, I stole that from SpongeBob. But anyways, and all of a sudden the name of the company is Isomers. I started laughing, I almost fell out my chair. I've seen a number of times where you'll see companies pick names from organic chemistry as their company names. And that's an isomer. Now, if you notice just before, like here, how do I tell you this molecule versus that molecule? One from column A and one from column B? That's not going to work out. And there was a problem that this existed around the turn of the century, 1900, and into the 1910s and 1920s. It became more of a problem because organic chemistry was really taking off. But before I talk about this, time for a commercial from Dr. White. Propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. But let's talk about nomenclature of organic compounds. Now, nomenclature is a fancy word meaning name or the names. And nomenclature is just how do you name organic molecules? Like how do we know this is propane, CH3, CH2, CH3? Well, it turned out the various countries in the world realized their governments, this is a serious problem for both communicating between scientists and for legal documents. What do I mean by legal documents? Well, if you have what's called a patent, and that's a legal document is issued by different governments like the United States that protect certain ideas called intellectual property. And organic chemistry, their patents are all of chemistry. I have 10 US patents. Like I said, I worked in the real world. And that you need to you know what molecules are people are talking about. What you don't know, what I do, because I worked in the chemical industry, when two companies, one's buying a chemical from the other, you have a contract, what's being sold, not only the price, but certain things called specifications. In the contract, they need to know what molecule you're talking about. And how did that get solved? An international and the switches off for there. The governments formed a treaty, signed a treaty that formed a new international organization known as IUPAC. IUPAC stands for International Union Pure Applied Chemistry. I'll never ask on a test what is IUPAC, but IUPAC is the organization that was formed. And if we do something real quick, sometimes when I do this, you may not see it. Does so everybody see on the internet IUPAC? Thumbs up, people. You see it? Thank you. And IUPAC, they have their website for many years before the internet. They put out these books, or one book, and they're known as in different colors. And those books, or actually book, had all the rules for how to name chemicals. The majority of their rules are for organic molecules. Do I know all the IUPAC rules? No. The last time they put out a book, it had close to 4,000 pages in it. I think that was the gold or green book. Now it's all on the internet. Does Dr. White know all the rules for chemicals I use? You better believe it, as well as I know my first name, which I do know. And this semester, you'll be learning IUPAC 
nomenclature rules for various molecules. Now, what I have to mention, this is a good time to mention it, is organic chemistry is broken down into what we call functional groups. And functional groups are a combination of atoms that have the same function. You look over here, whoop, over there, you can see that's better. Hold on, it's hard to do things backwards. My door. And what's the door for? To go from one room to the other. And also it has the thing that closes the door. Now, if you got into the room you're in through a door that actually closes, it probably looks different than my door right over here. And that's because doors are different, but you know the function of a door. Same thing with molecules, certain combination of atoms are called functional groups and IUPAC are broken down by functional groups. Uh, oh no, uh, let me go another three minutes and we'll take a break. Once in a while, I've got to put down a post in here. What are my break times? Because I'm thinking in terms of classroom at ECC, not here. So this organization, IUPAC, was formed. And so main function in life is to develop all the rules for the naming any chemical compound, which is quite a daunting task, which they were up to. What they did, you'll see this semester, is beyond fantastic. Now, you know something? This would be a good time to take a break. I'm going to give you a little longer break. Don't tell anybody. Let's see. Come back at 2.50. In about seven minutes, come back. And Dr. White's going to go once again stretch. See you at uh, 2.50.
right, let's get started. I found out the reason I couldn't get into D2L, which I usually, I didn't get a warning message. My password expired. So I won't do that now, I'll play with it. I'll play with it later. But luckily everything on there, I also have on my computer. All right, we're talking about nomenclature. Now, nomenclature for alkanes, there's certain IUPAC names for that. And an example of an IUPAC name is propane, CH3, CH2, CH3. What I'd like to do now is explain why I was doing this. Now, in my class, there's going to be times when you've got to do a lot of memorization, well, you a lot. An example, how do you memorize things? Well, what I did today was for an obnoxious number of times, I showed you propane and the structure CH3, CH2, CH3. If I were to ask you, what's the structure of propane? Close your eyes and think about it. Can you see that picture in your mind? Can you see the CH3, CH2, CH3? If I were in a classroom, I would have written this in the corner of the board and I would have walked over to it every time during the hour. What I've done is by, I have found, <clears throat> and it works for both me and many, many students. If you write something down and say it five times, you will memorize it. It works much better than flashcards. True story. After test number one, I had two students come up to me. Yes, we were at campus so a number of years ago. And one of them did real well, got an A, and the other one didn't do real well, not too well. And the one who didn't do well said, what can I do to do better on your test? I said, the first thing is things you have to memorize like names and structures and some formula or chemical reactions. Did you write it down and say it five times? And she said, no, that's a lot of work. And her friend who got an A said, yeah, but it helped me get an A. And the other one got the message real quick. And she started doing that. And the next test she did real good and the rest of the test. And luckily, because you dropped the lowest score in the four hourly exams, you wound up getting a good grade. And uh, I can tell you, whatever works for you, do it. But that method of writing things down and saying it four times in your mind, if you're in a place where it's supposed to be quiet, you can think about it, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, write it and say it. And that works like a charm. Look for me. And it should work for you. All right, let's let me open something. Now, if you look on the screen now, you'll see from, if you had the textbook, this ta table 2.1, which has the IUPAC names for carbon alkanes, meaning straight chain, not rings, from one to 10. However, there's a lot on this table you don't need to know. So what have I done? Does everybody see the alkane IUPAC names, two columns on your screen? Give me a thumbs up if you see it. Thank you. I know you may not like it, but I tried to contact Zoom, not today, but a couple of weeks ago, more than that, and they're not wanting to talk to me. But anyways, 
let's look at the alkane names. One carbon, methane. Two carbons, ethane. Three carbons, propane. Four, butane. Five, pentane. Six, hexane. Seven, <clears throat> heptane. Hold on. Eight, <clears throat> eight octane. Haven't talked this long for a while. Got to get back to used to doing it. Nine, no name. Ten, decade. These are the IUPAC names for molecules that are alkanes one through 10. You need to know both of these. Why do I say you need to know these? If you don't know these like you know your first name, you've lost 50 points on test one. You've lost, and hold on, you don't have to write these down real quick and I'll explain why in a second. If you want to go ahead. If you don't know these names, you've lost about 35 points on test two and three, not that much on test four, and you've lost about 40% of the points on the final, if you don't know these names. Now, if you go to D2L, you'll see a file in the folder that says lectures, and the name of the file is alkanes, IUPAC names, and number of carbon atoms, this right here, and you can download it and I would start memorizing it. And how would you do that? An easy way would be on a piece of paper, write down methane, one carbon, then do it again. And say it, methane, one carbon, and do it three more times. If you do that and do it another time, you'll learn this table. Now, what do I mean by IUPAC names? And you need to know, if I give you a structure, what's this IUPAC name? If I give you a name, you will need to know how to draw that. Relax, we'll be practicing that. Let's take a look at Unfortunately, what I can't do, which I can do on in a classroom, I can't do on Zoom, is have this open. That's not what I want. And also right on the whiteboard, Zoom doesn't allow me to do that, but let's look at this. If I ask you, say sometime in the future you saw something three points each, Draw the structure for butane. How would you do that? Because I'm sure you want your three points. Well, butane, you would know is four carbon. And now it's acyclic. Butane is not in a ring, so I put in my four carbons. You know there are four bonds to carbon and you can put in the hydrogen, so I do it right. And that would be butane. Let's do the same thing again, draw the structure.
And the question would be, draw the structure And why don't you try this one? I'm gonna make you work today. Dr. White's gonna be cruel. Why don't you draw the structure for pentane? And be sure to put it in all necessary hydrogens. And when you're done, if you want, give me a thumbs up any way you want to do it. Or just look up and smile. That will work too if you got your video on. Those who are quicker than others, please be patient. I try and give everybody time to finish. I think everybody's done. So how do you do this? First of all, you have memorized this chart. And I highly recommend this week start memorizing it. You're not going to memorize it a couple days before the test. I'm assuming you want to do good on the test. And I hope that's true. So pentane, you've learned it. Pentane, five carbons. So now I'm going to draw five carbons. You know there are four bonds to carbon. a lot of practice writing on my tablet. And you can figure out how to put the hydrogens in. Remember, count the lines. This carbon has one, two bonds, four minus two is two, and that's why there are two hydrogens. Now, if you got that wrong, don't worry. You're all rookies. You're just starting out. I don't expect you, but practice makes perfect. Therefore, it's highly important, highly important, it's extremely important that you start learning this chart. And the best way I know to learn is take time, write down methane, one carbon, do that five times, methane, octane, eight carbons. Ooh, where have I heard that? We'll talk more about octane later in this chapter. Now, Time for a public service announcement from Dr. White. This chapter, alkanes and cycloalkanes, hydrocarbons, though very important, is boring. It's about as exciting if you go into a five-star Michelin restaurant, which is a super, super best restaurant, and order a glass of water, and two pieces of dry white toast. I stole that from the Blues Brothers. Not that exciting, especially if you look at their menu. By the way, Dr. White's been in five-star restaurants in the United States and Europe, and they can be quite good, uh, outstanding. But this chapter is like that. Later chapters, it gets to be a lot of fun and really exciting. So just hang in there. Now, there are two types of nomenclature naming problems. One is draw the structure. The other is, and hopefully you all can see the whiteboard now, if not scream or get my attention. Hmm. 
Nope, I already did that. Ah. Now, question would be, give the IUPAC name for the following. IUPAC, and the only thing you have to know, even though I like to say, because I think it's cool, International Union Pure Applied Chemistry, that means the official name. We'll learn later on, there are also things called common names, which for certain things I'll teach you. So how do you do that? You count the carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, six carbons. It's in a chain, straight chain. It's an alkane. And you've learned this table. I can switch back and forth now. This table and six carbons is hexane. So what would be the answer here? And the answer is hexane. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's do another one and I'll help you out. First of all, I'll let you count how many carbons are there. Hopefully you got that now. And you look at this table. Everybody find what they were looking for? And if you notice two carbons, ethane. Let's go back and do that. How many carbons in this molecule I just wrote? One, two. By the way, I'm assuming you know C is carbon, H is hydrogen, O is oxygen, N is nitrogen, and a few other atoms. My periodic table is very small. And therefore, one, two carbons, look on the table, you've learned that's ethane. So far, so good. Now, let's look at the following. Same thing. And the question is, what's the name of this molecule? You say, oh, I'll count carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six. And you say, that's hexane. But wait, this is hexane. Important thing about IUPAC. And I have a new office chair, and the wheels are quite zooming. <laughs> but anyways, IUPAC rules. Each molecule has only one name, and one name is only for one, each individual separate molecule. Isomers have different names. I have yet to see an exception to that rule. And I've looked, and I've worked in organic chemistry. Um, I hate to say this, more years than all of you have been alive, but it's true. Never, never are there two molecules with the same IUPAC name. So what do we do? We've got a problem. And if you look here, here's hexane is straight chain. But here, this molecule, which has six carbons, is not straight. There's something hanging over here. And this is called branch. This is a branch molecule. And this is a branch, just like trees have branches coming off. 
the main trunk and branches have a special name. And let's talk about this. Let's go back. Oh, by the way, Dr. White can be subtle. You should know these names and structures. What I mean by that, how many carbons. Now, IUPAC rules, and I've modified to make it simpler, simpler for you. The general name for a cyclic saturated carbon, hydrocarbons, is alkanes. And you'll learn later on about the A and the ending. Right now, we don't have to worry about it. Alkanes without branches are named to the number of carbon atoms, the table or the one I have there. So six carbons, like I showed you, alkane hexane. Now, alkanes with branches, now it gets interesting. The root name of that alkane is that of the longest continuous chain of carbons. And now I have to teach you how to number the longest chain. Now, if we look at this molecule, the question is, what's the longest chain? If I do this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, that's a chain. Chain like the chain around your neck or a bicycle chain has links. This carbon is linked to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. We count one, two, three, four, five. So doing this way, there are five carbons. Now another chain would be this carbon, This carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, this carbon. And you say, well, they're not straight across. No, but they're linked together. So this chain also has five carbons. Let's see if I have another color. Let me change this one. Now, another chain would be this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon. And now this has three carbons. So what's the longest chain? Well, now you have to do the high level math in organic chemistry. What's the largest number? And hopefully all agree five is larger than three. So the longest chain Hold on. I this morning put these in my toolbar, which up there. with a new document. And 
and I'll call this, there are two ways I could do it. I'll use that chain, five carbons. Now if you look, hold on. Everybody see that on the screen now? Good. You have five carbons right here. And if you looked on the table, what do we call five carbons? Pentane. So the root name is the number of carbons is generated by the number of carbons in the longest chain. Now, are we done? And the answer is no, because we have something left over. And this is called a substituent or an alkyl group. And how do we name alkyl groups? If you go to D2L, you'll see a file in the lecture area that's key alkyl groups. Now, there are more alkyl groups for, for this class than most of organic chemistry. These are the key ones. When CH3 is bonded, and that's what this long line means, to some long chain, or you'll learn later on a ring, it's called a methyl group. When you have two carbons like this, CH3, CH2, bonded to a long chain or a ring, it's called an ethyl group. Now, for three carbons, there are two possibilities. One is when you have three in a straight line and the end carbon is bonded to a chain or ring, we call that n propyl. And the end is smaller case, because later on you'll learn capital N means something else in organic chemistry. When you have three carbons in a substituent, or just call it alkyl group, and the center carbon is bonded to the chain or ring, we call that isopropyl. N-propyl, N-carbon, isopropyl, center carbon. Let me think. How many of you have ever heard of isopropyl alcohol? Hopefully some of you have. And that's a molecule I'll teach you later on, rubbing alcohol. And the term isopropyl alcohol came from the isopropyl group. Now, when you have four carbons, there's three possibilities. Two of those I've encountered. The third one in my professional career, I've never encountered. And therefore, I'm not going to teach you that. When you have four carbons, one, two, three, four, and they're in a straight chain, and the end carbon is bonded to a chain or ring, we call that N-butyl. When we have four carbons and three of them are bonded to a center carbon and that's bonded to a ring or chain, we call that a chert butyl. But in about a week, Dr. White's going to be a lazy organic chemist and we call that T butyl. On a test, you can use chert or T. In about a week, I'm going to start using chert butyl. And that's the alkyl groups. Time for Dr. White to be subtle. That should be structures. You should know these. How do you learn them? You write them down and say them five times. You need to know this. If you don't know this, you've just blown 50 points out of 100 on test one, 
about 35-40 on test two and three, and about 35-40% of points on the final. One carbon, CH3, methyl. One carbon, CH3, methyl. And you do that for each of these. Yes, you do have to memorize these. In about five or six weeks, you'll say, why did I ever thought that was hard? Because you'll know these like you know your first name. And you do need to know. So let's go back and look at our example. And CH3 is a methyl group. So this is now methyl pentane. The alkyl group or substituent as it's sometimes called is the name of that is put in front. Now, are we done? Well, let's look at something. Hopefully you now see alkanes with branches. The root name is the longest continuous carbon atom. I'll never ask you. Groups attached to the main chain are called substituents. I'll never ask you what a substituent is. In this class, we'll be sticking mainly to what's called the saturated substituents called, and only have carbon and hydrogen and carbon carbon single bonds. We call those the alkyl groups. And alkyl groups, here's one way of doing it. The easier way is to memorize that chart. Now, we're not done. The main chain is numbered in such a way that the first substituent accounted, encountered along the chain receives the lowest possible number. And each substituent is located by its name and number to which it's attached. I'll talk about the rest in a little while. Now, right now you're saying, oh, what's going on? Relax, we're gonna practice this not only today, but other times. So after you practice it a month from now, you'll look back and say, why did I think that was hard? That's because you're new to this and it is hard when you're new to it. So if we look at this compound, we're asked to find a UPAC name, the longest chain, five carbons, pentane. What's left over? An alkyl group, which we identified as methyl. Now we need to find the number of carbon it's on. Think about if I were to send some people postcards and I put down your name, your street name, your city, town, and your zip code, would you get your postcard? Probably not because you need a house number, apartment number in front. Now, how do we number these? A chain, the longest chain, we can start here, one, two, three, four, five, or we can start at this end, one, I don't know why that's being funky on me. Let's try you. One, two, three, four, five. Now you have two choices, two or four. And now you have to use your high level math skills, which is the smaller number. Because when you're naming and numbering substituents, the number you give always is the lowest possible. And therefore, the name of this would be 2-methyl pentane. Take a deep breath. It may be confusing. Let's do another one. And now the question is, again, what's the IUPAC name? 
official name for this molecule. Now, the first thing is you've got to find what's the longest chain. Since you haven't had much practice, I'll help you. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's one chain. I didn't want to do that. Did I miss? I don't know why this is messing me up. We open up a new one. All right, sorry about the delay. Longest chain, this would be six. We want here one, two, three, four. That's less than six. We start here one, two, three, four, five. That's less than six. So the longest chain is six, which I'll encircle like this. And if you knew your alkane, six is hexane. Now, what do we have left over? CH3. And that's called a methyl group. Now, we have to find what carbon is the methyl group on. And how do you do that? You find the longest, uh, which way is the lowest number counting from always the end. Common mistake, student will start counting here and call that one. That's wrong. Going this way is six, going the other way, one, two, three, four. And now you have to determine which is the lower number, four or three, or three or four. And hopefully I'll pick three. And that's three methyl hexane. For some reason, these keys on top that I put on, I didn't use it during the summer, are causing me problems. Now, I'm gonna let you have some fun. The only thing I'd like you to do is, why don't you figure out what is the longest chain? Have some fun.
Remember, why is that hook carbons together? That's part of the chain, uh, one of the possible chains. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up if your video is on or smile. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. I guess for some reason putting a shortcut on top of the toolbar doesn't play well with Zoom. All right, let's do this. If we look at the easiest chain right across, remember one of the skills you have to know how to count up to 10. Oh, I should point out, this is how I do a seven. I learned that in high school from my German teacher, thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I've been doing it ever since. So that's one chain. Let's look at another chain. This carbon is bonded to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon, to this carbon. And then I'll put it in a circle. This carbon is bonded to this carbon which is bonded to this carbon, which is bonded to this carbon. So let's look at our choices. We have seven, we have six, and we have four. What's the longest chain? And the answer is seven. I won't do it. Let's do one more of these. And since we're almost out of time, I'll do this one. And the question is, what's the longest chain? You don't have to have the longest chain straight across. Let's look at this one. If I take this one, two, three, four, I can start here, one, two, three, four, five, this carbon right here, six, seven, Eight. I could also have this one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. So the longest chain would be eight, and it's not always straight across when organic chemists draw that. If I look at the clock, I look at it and say, guess what? We're out of time. Remember, because I only took a five minute break instead of 10 like I normally would in a classroom, I'm not going to make you suffer more or go longer. I think we've had a good day. Now, listen carefully. On Monday, and I will have it tonight, and Wednesdays from 6 to 7.15 or 7.30, I will have Zoom office hours if you need help, stop by. If you don't need help, well, don't stop by. We'll meet again on Wednesday. Normally we would have a lecture in a lab, but because of the coming Labor Day, and we'll be off on Monday, so I won't do a Zoom lecture then. I'm just gonna lecture there and I'll go the whole time. It's one of the few times I will do that. So with that, office hours are individual. Uh, Angela or anybody else, if you need help, show up. 
Now, if there's more than one person, there'll be two people there. Uh, I've never had a problem. Same thing if you came to my office at ECC, if I had two people, I'd switch between the two. Usually there are not a lot of people there. So hopefully that helps. Now, with that, uh, Barb, I'll go through that in a second with you. I didn't see your question. If you're uh, confused, I'll be more than happy to help you right after this. With that, for the rest of you, I'm going to say goodbye. And so here's some Yiddish words I'm going to teach you. Yiddish is a mixture of German and Jew, Hebrew. I'm going to say gain gesund. That means be healthy. And with that, gain gesund. I'll see you on Wednesday. If you need help, see me at my office hours in Boston.